Good evening, future techies. My name is Ryan Kirchner. I'm the Associate Director of Recruitment here for the Polytechnic Institute. And I wanna welcome you to our School of Aviation and Transportation Technology broadcast to give you some further insight and details about the majors in that department and what you could expect to experience here at the Polytechnic. I'm joined by a few panelists and they're gonna introduce themselves here in a few minutes, uh, but I just wanna go over a couple of logistical things for this broadcast so you can interact with us and ask the questions that you want to learn about. So there's a chat function within the YouTube to broadcast where you can log in with your Google account or create one real quick if you haven't done so before and post those questions into that chat. We're, we have some topics that we've already established that we're going to talk about and bring those to our panelists, but we want to know what you want to know. So send in those questions to us and we'll pull those out of that chat as well. There are two students who are part of that department as well, uh, one in professional flight and one in aviation management who are going to be responding to those questions directly in the chat as well. But if there are some big larger questions that we think would be important for everybody here, we will be sure to bring those out. Um, so again, send in those questions. We want to know what you want to know. Um, if you don't get your question answered tonight, um, we're gonna try to cover everything um, from the things that we've established as well as the questions you submit. But you could also send us an email um, to techrecruit at purdue.edu. We will respond to that as soon as we can um, and get those questions answered for you um, in, in as timely manner as possible. So um, with that, we'll go ahead and, and, and have our panelists introduce themselves. So uh, Brian, let's start with you please. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Brian Dillman, a uh, professor in uh, the professional flight program. Uh, I actually went through the flight program back in the uh, early 90s. Um, I teach predominantly in the uh, lower division coursework, uh, freshman, sophomore year. Uh, I'm also a designated pilot examiner, so the students as they go through their training, uh, when they take check rides, they, uh, they may be with me uh, during that certification test. All right, excellent. Thank you very much. And then Michael. Hi, my name is Michael Holbrook. I'm currently a junior uh, in the professional flight technology major uh, here at Purdue. Um, I'm a flight instructor down at Hangar 6. I actually got my commercial with Professor Dillman, so uh, that's pretty pretty cool there. Um, and yeah, I'm the president of Aviation Ambassadors and also leader of Purdue Aviation Day. So any questions on any sort of student organizations or things like that, feel free to send them my way. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. And then lastly, Tim. Yeah, good evening, guys. Uh, my name is Tim Rock, and I'm a professor in aeronautical engineering technology, which is primarily in air vehicle maintenance. So that is the FAA Part 147 A and P program. Um, that's the primary area that I teach in. I teach large air vehicle maintenance. I get to play with the big aircraft. Um, I teach safety management systems. I've done a lot of safety management collaboration with Professor Dillman as well. And let's see, I went through the AET program also back uh, mid late 90s, stayed for my graduate work, was out working, uh, worked for United Airlines for a period of time and then got invited back to teach and research here in 2005. So I have been back in a faculty and research position since that time. So welcome. All right, thank you all very much for the introductions. Uh, just start off real quick, and Tim, we'll stick with you. Um, could you share a little bit, maybe you can give some insight about what kind of coursework is shared amongst the majors in the aviation department? Since, you know, there's professional flight, there's aviation management, there's your AET program. What kind of coursework do students take together to kind of get a sense of aviation overall? Yeah, and uh, um, Dr. Delman can jump in and uh, fill in the gaps here, but Especially uh, your first year coursework, a lot of times you'll, you'll get some of your typical coursework specific to aviation would be um, AT100, which is an introduction to aviation operations. There's an aviation operations management course, which is beginning to segregate a little bit to specialize towards flight area, but we still have crossover in that. So there are some introductions to the landscape and uh, just the overall, um, the overall intro to aviation that, that many of our students, all four of our primary majors will take. Uh, that along, uh, a lot of times you'll, you'll take math courses or English courses as well. You may cross pollinate with a few of those other majors. And Brian, you wanna, you wanna share a little bit more insight for that? Yeah, I guess the only thing I would add would be that the uh, the, the students in the aviation uh, program uh, were out at the airport, which is a little bit away from the primary campus, uh, and you know due to the to you know remoteness of the uh, the actual facilities, um, even if you're not in a specific course with another student, you tend to see each other uh, in the same area, same proximity as you're interacting, walking through the hallways. Uh, we also have. 
a, a lounge area uh, that students can utilize. Uh, it's called the Sky Lounge, uh, where they can, um, we'll see students in there studying, eating, eating lunch, uh, doing a variety of things, you know, taking a break, whatever it may be. So there's a lot of interaction, even outside of coursework, um, that, uh, you know, amongst the programs that students can uh, get to know one another and uh, have opportunity to, uh, to uh, make connections in that way. All right, great. Well, and I'll start with you. Uh, Tim, you want to add something else? Uh, just to say that spurred another thought, sorry about that, but um, in, in addition to the, the extracurricular activities, we do a lot of uh, collaborative research. So we do, uh, I run a research laboratory that works with all four majors and from freshman all the way to PhD. And so several of our faculty do cross-disciplinary research in which we will take um, even certain uh, a certain number of freshman students and take them on board to introduce them to, to sort of co-mingle because when you get out into the real world, as many of you probably know, uh, both above and below the wing, you have to work and collaborate with all of the other disciplines. Nothing happens in a vacuum in aviation. And so we do have research experiences and learning, um, active learning experiences that we will mix all of those groups together. All right, that's good again to get a good sense of everything that's going on in, in the whole aviation field. Very nice. Um, could you maybe share a little bit about if there are a lot of if you hear about students um, doing double majors or minors within the aviation department or or other things like that? And Tim, maybe you can start with you as well. Yeah, I'll give you what I can here. It's not uncommon. We get uh, it's probably been a slow ramp up. I get more and more students in who uh, might be double majoring. Some of them that might have started out. In engineering, um, like aerospace engineering, and saw the aerospace engineering or aeronautical engineering technology component and said, Hey, I'd like to add that. Could I double major in that? Um, we've had double majors from completely different disciplines, but we're interested in a secondary discipline. So, some from finance and accounting, and um, pick a major. So, it's not uncommon. Um, I don't, I can't articulate down to the day and month how long that extends your program, but it, it, in, Certain cases will extend it um, reasonably as you would expect, especially if you start to go for like a federal licensure or certification. But it's not uncommon. We work with a lot of double majors. And Brian, did you have any, anything to add about that? Since, you know, looking at professional flight students, is there, do you see a, a good number of students doing that as well, or pursuing those types of opportunities? Yeah, I, I would say it depends to some extent how many credits a student brings in. To Purdue, um, you know, with with AP coursework, with dual credit courses, things of that nature, <clears throat> we're seeing a lot of um, students coming with uh, enough credits that really opens up their um, their their coursework, you know, their load to be able to look at, you know, taking a minor uh, or 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 a dual dual major. Um, we do have within the plan of studies what we call a thematic selective, um, which is twelve credit hours uh, of coursework. Um, a lot of students choose to take a minor uh, to fill that requirement, but some look at the uh, the opportunity of doing a dual major if they have enough pre pre credit coming in um, to be able to to leverage that uh, for a double major. The the one the one tricky part with flight in particular is because of the flight classes being very sequential and and being locked in as far as a time frame within the given semester uh, that does create a little bit of maneuvering uh, required to be able to make it work, but. Uh, with some creative, you know, opportunities and, and you know interactions with our with our academic advisors who are who are very um, you know high quality as far as you know what what's necessary to be able to you know fill all the boxes, um, it's it's still doable. All right, good. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, we don't have an advisor with us tonight, but definitely, if you're interested, the, the advising contact information is on our website on the, the different majors pages on the department, and you can send them an email and, and get in touch with them, especially if you are expecting some AP credit or you have dual enrollment um, with another institution to kind of see what that would look like and how that would transfer into Purdue, just kind of get a sense of what kind of credits you're going to have and, and how you can free up some of your time to maybe pursue a minor or double major if you want to get really crazy with it um, and then want to turn to Michael just kind of get a little bit of a student perspective with your with your professional flight degree kind of walk us through the coursework and, and Brian was just uh, mentioning the the sequential order of the courses and you know very scheduled how does that look in terms of your schedule of flight times and coursework uh, yeah so like you said it's it's a certain order you start you know if you come in with or without your private and this is just for professional flight students and then you kind of go from there so you'll go into the commercial training and then instrument training and you'll get those um, you know, certificates and ratings as well. And then you get your multi-engine. 
Um, and then you just kind of move along and you move your right through the program. So I'm a certified flight instructor. A lot of people are, and just that helps build hours and build time. Um, and so that's what kind of like the normal route would be. Uh, and then kind of once you start getting into the upper level, that's when you start getting into more of like the jet training, the simulators and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, that's pretty much the normal, the normal for professional flight majors, the normal pro progression of the, of the major, um, but coursework wise, it's, you know, it's just put in the time and put in the efforts like anything else. It's not, there's no secret to success. If you put in the time, you're going to be successful within the program. Um, so it's not anything crazy, but it is definitely a, a time commitment and making sure that you, you know, put in the time and the effort to make sure you're successful within, within the major. All right. Very cool. And we had, we had a question come in earlier the, today from one of our emails about, um, asking what's the average flight hours that students graduate with in this program. Maybe Michael, you can share and Brian, you might have some more insight as well. Yeah, so it, it definitely varies depend on the depending on the student. So if somebody were to just come in and just bare minimum, um, only fly in the program and not fly anywhere else, not get their certified flight instructor or anything like that, um, I would say around 250-ish is where it gets you. Um, whereas, you know, the IC students and me personally, I will graduate with my 1,000 hours. Right now, I'm writing around 810 hours, and there are other students that are graduating around the same. Um, I know in my class alone, there's – you know, people that are graduating in three years with 1,000 hours. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the student. If you get your certified flight instructor and if you fly, most people do graduate with, you know, I would say 500 or more hours. Um, it's really just, it, it varies by the student. Yeah, most, the only thing I would add to that, most of our students get their certified flight instructor between the, the your, uh, their sophomore and junior year uh, during that summer time frame. Uh, and then they'll come back and they'll instruct in some form or fashion for either Purdue University or uh, pre aviation uh, on the airport. The, the big differentiator is what they do in the summers between their junior and senior year. And then, you know, right after their senior year, it, it is how much they're going to graduate with. So if you're in a program, uh, you know, in a flight instructing activity where you're going to build 800 hours a month or 100 hours a month, something of that nature, it's going to really jack that, that flight time up uh, during that time frame. And, and Michael mentioned the thousand hours for those not familiar, the thousand hours is a, is a magic benchmark that qualifies our, our graduates for the restricted ATP. And so they can go straight to the, the airlines, either a regional or a major airline um, uh, with that benchmark. If, if you don't graduate from a program that's qualified or certified under the restricted ATP, you have to get to 1500 hours, which is going to add about another six months or a year to the time necessary. So in Michael's case, he's going to graduate from Purdue and, and be eligible to go straight to an airline right from graduation. Yeah, that's awesome to be able to, to take advantage of those opportunities to get those hours up. So yeah, I definitely recommend that for all of our students who are able to do that. Um, did have a question come in from the chat um, where someone asked if we come in with a private license and are but are in the AET program, are they still eligible or able to work on an instrument rating at the same time? And Brian, maybe you can respond to that. Yeah, so um, because of the, the resources necessary to do flight training within the Purdue University structure, um, we unfortunately have to restrict flight activity to students that are in the flight program. Now, any student can take ground school courses. So we have an instrument ground school, which is AT249. Um, we have a commercial ground school, which is AT254. Uh, so any student in the, in the School of Aviation Transportation Technology, as long as there's space available in the classroom, can take the ground schools. For the flight training component, you would end up going across the airport, uh, which is the most, it's, it's the closest uh, service provider, uh, Purdue Aviation, and, and do your flight training over there. Okay, very cool. Good to hear. Um, in terms of what's happening now, I know we're kind of in an odd situation with this pandemic and, you know, nobody's here on campus. Um, obviously, flight times and simulator times are on for the time being. What's that going to look like in the fall? I know Purdue uh, President Mitch Daniels put out a message to, earlier this week that we are planning to be on the fall semester on campus, just maybe look a little different. How is that going to look for flight specifically, where you're going to spend a lot of time in an airplane close quarters, in a simulator close quarters? How is that going to look? Have we made any plans or adjustments for that yet? Yeah, so um, let me let me back up just a little bit. So the, uh, the the students that were in the flight program for the spring of 2020, so this past semester, um, essentially at spring break uh, is where all of our flight operations ceased because of the pandemic. Uh, so those students all received incompletes for the courses that they were enrolled in for the flight training. All the ground school courses continued, and we, we've been doing remote, uh, you know, training, remote coursework uh, to be able to finish those out. Um, 
the the flight operations will resume in what we call mod three so in the summer sessions there's three four week modules mod one is what people commonly refer to as may mester uh, mod two is is the middle four weeks uh, goes from about middle of june to middle of july and then mod three starts in middle of july and goes till the first first part of august then there's about a two week break and then the fall semester begins so all the students that that got incompletes in the spring semester are going to return to campus, at least the ones that are able to, uh, for mod three, and we're intending to finish up their coursework uh, in that module, um, which should be doable. Um, you know, during the normal semester, you 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 would have had eight weeks of time, but you would be taking other courses. Um, we have four weeks of time, uh, and we're going to be solely focused on the flight activities. Um, so assuming that they finish their flight course in that third module. Uh, in the fall semester, they'll begin uh, their, their, their coursework that they would have been taking in the fall semester. If they're planning on taking some summer courses, they would have just started that in the fall. All the incoming freshmen will be enrolling in the courses that they would be planning to take uh, as an incoming freshman. The, the, the protocols that we're uh, enacting to try to address any sort of transmission issues, any sort of um, you know, uh, aspects of, of you know, transference of the virus, things of that nature, protection, uh, it's very much following the, the guidelines from the CDC and, and other aspects. Um, we're learning more about this virus as time goes and, and, and the, the rigor and necessary, um, you know, safety precautions that are necessary to, to be able to address it. Um, when, when we were looking at resuming operations in the summer before we pushed it to mod three, uh, we had developed a protocol which, which provided social separation as much as possible. So things in, in, in terms of uh, a student when typically uh, prior to the, to the pandemic, they would come into the dispatching area, they would meet their instructor, they'd be mingling with other instructors, other students, they would talk to dispatch, they would get their airplane, their keys, they'd walk through the hangar area, they'd go out to the airplane. So they're interacting with, with several people, you know, probably the nature of 25 or 30 people during that time frame. Uh, we changed the protocol so that as a student comes to the airport, they go straight to the airplane. So there's a, there's a mechanism that facilitates them to be able to identify what that airplane is and go straight to the location of that airplane to minimize the amount of interaction that we're going to have. Um, we're, 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 so that's, that's the extreme at end of, of the protocols. Um, you know, we're, we're talking right now about, uh, you know, looking at face masks, looking at, you know, you know, you know, removing or, or you know, creating barriers between instructor and student. Um, having an assessment protocol to identify, you know, the 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 uh, the risk of a student, you know, having having the uh, the virus and then uh, being you know able to transmit it. So um, we're beta testing all those different flavors right now and trying to identify um, what that looks like. Uh, our test run will be in mod three uh, with our existing students. So the incoming freshman class will be engaged in in what I would say, you know, the B model or the C model after we make modifications to the process to ensure smooth, smooth operation. All right, it sounds like we're really looking ahead and, and making some adjustments. And I um, just want to mention that on the uh, aviation technology homepage, there's a link to the things that we are doing within this department to try to you know, minimize the risk of students. Um, so check check that out just to kind of get a sense of, obviously Brian did a great job of explaining what's going on, but for that more official and any new updates that come out, that's going to be up on that homepage as well. Um, so I want to turn it over to um, Tim to get a question about our AET program. And we had a question come in from the chat um, that someone mentioned to them that the course plan was going to change to allow earning the A&P certification a little sooner than what had been done in the past. And is that still going to be possible for this fall or what's what's that look like? Um, well, let, let me I'll just chime in with what Dr. Dillman said. Um, what Brian said is basically we're still building that bridge as we walk out onto it over the summer as far as what I could speak to as policy. So I need to put a caveat on that that. Um, with our protocols and the, uh, the, the emergency or contingency planning, we are planning a best case would be a regular fall startup. Um, I think what, what we have done in the prior to the pandemic is we overhauled our AET curriculum to allow under normal operation a student to come in and get uh, more of their technical and the, the FAA airframe and power plant, the part 147 technical coursework out of the way 
at the first two years. So after about 60 hours, which you, you typically will take around 15 or 16 credit hours per semester. So at the end of 60 credit hours, and that's about a 1900 hour program, but the, the credit hours at the end of the first four semesters, most students then would be eligible. So um, ideally, if you follow all the coursework as planned, um, along with the practical components, which is what the pandemic has put a little bit of a stick in the spokes for right now, at the end of your sophomore year, most students would be eligible to take the FAA um, A&P exam. There's an oral, a written, uh, actually three written, and then a practical examination as well. Um, so right, the way we have it now is that students will come in and, and matriculate through the all four years, and at the end of the four years, they will have wrapped up all of their same coursework. We've simply moved the a and coursework up to the first two years. Um, that's our, that's a, a fall 2020 curriculum that's been approved. Um, so again, with that said, back to what Brian said, um, much of that will depend on, as far as the timing on it, much of that's going to depend on what we are allowed to come back to. We also have um, distancing and disinfection protocols that we have put in place for our labs, very similar to flight. There's altered pathways, literally, that the students will show up to out of the aircraft. Um, the laboratory experiences are being planned so that we can minimize the, the proximity when we need to wear the proper um, personal protective equipment or PPE. Um, so we're, we're pulling those contingency plans in as well. So that's a, when it's all going well, uh, when the world is healthy and we're not in solitary confinement, um, that is that the first two years typically now will be the plan for the student to be able to get their FAA coursework out of the way. The second two years, then the last four semesters, you would finish up your bachelor's degree program. And what that does is opens up the ability for you to take more research-based courses, more advanced um, uh, next generation courses as, the, as the, the world, as the industry changes, you're a little freed up to take some, some more of the cooler courses. Don't have to worry quite so much on the, the time frame that way. That's the, the idea behind it. So that hopefully that gets your question. If not, let me know. No, it definitely does. Absolutely. Just to kind of yeah, clarify what that where that coursework falls and, and where they can get get that so that, that possible certification completed. Yeah, it definitely helps. Um and then another question related to AET came in from the chat. Um we had a kind of we had had to prep this uh, question as well. Um, is there aspects of spacecraft, so aer aerospace related um, vehicles, in, or is it just more focused on uh, planes and, and within the atmosphere type of uh, vehicles within this program? Um, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. There is and there isn't. We, uh, we do have systems oriented classes because, as you know, the, uh, the, the privatized of the civilian space market, Blue Origin, SpaceX, um, all those kinds of things are taking off literally. There was some, especially prior to the pandemic, there were some big um, targets by many of the privatized space companies for um, um, first low orbit, first entry, that kind of thing. And with that comes the specialized skills that our students bring from AET. I can tell you that we've had, I knew of two of my graduates just with the bachelor's that went to SpaceX because of their um, the design and, and the, the composite and the, some of the exotic material repair that we start to get into. So you may go through a basic composite course or a si aircraft systems course. A lot of those systems have DNA that carries over into a spacecraft system. Um, and in some cases, those same skill sets are being used or starting out being used in the, in the space uh, vehicle industry. So there is there's enough crossover where um, our students are looked at and some of them are selected to go work directly in those companies. Okay, that's good to hear. Yeah, it kind of gets some, some some different outcomes. And and then on the on the flip side, I guess you'd see more students from AET go on places like Boeing, for example, other other companies you want to give examples for? Sure. Um, Boeing, Lockheed, Airbus, Curtis Wright, Pratt & Whitney, Rolls-Royce, um, those are uh, Pat Whitney, GE, those are the big engine makers. Uh, I've had a, we've got two graduates go to NASA. I've got a graduate from the A&T program. She went, uh, was at uh, Mission Control and got to teach astronauts tool maintenance with her A&T certification. And there's some things that she got to do that she took great joy in telling me she couldn't tell me because it was top secret and all I got was a hat. So I'm very proud 
when my students are able to do that. So yeah, our students go, they go all over. We've got uh, students that have graduated and gone into uh, Duke Energy and wind turbine because of the turbine components and those, uh, um, yeah, the, the, the high, high expense and high technology components on turbines. Um, they go all over. It's not just confined to the aviation and aerospace industry, but that's, I just named a bulk of the aerospace and aviation areas. And obviously the air carriers match them up quite readily. All right, awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I want to turn to Michael and just kind of get a, a, a your feedback about the electronic Purdue bag that all the students in this department get. Could you kind of explain what that is and, and how that benefits you as a student? Um, so, yeah, so the electronic Purdue bag is basically an iPad that we all got. Um, I got mine last year. Uh, so every student now coming into the School of Aviation is going to get one. Um, so basically it helps and I can see in two aspects. Number one is a student. It gives you that device that you'll need. It has everything that you need to start at Purdue on it. It's got our flight operations. It has any app that you might need downloaded, how to get you know onto your My Purdue account, um, getting to Blackboard, things like that, where all your classes are. That uh, iPad is going to serve as that kind of home base. Um, and then number two, sort of as a flight instructor, coming from the professional flight aspect, you know, when, when our students kind of get into that instrument training, um, they start using electronic charts. And I, th and I think that a little issue that we had in, in the past and when I first started flight instructing here was, I would have to tell my students like, hey, you need some form of an electronic chart here, you know, just an iPad or, um, you know, sometimes I'd have to give my student, you know, in the simulator, my iPad because they didn't have it yet. Um, so now they're gonna come in with it, you know, already in their hands and they'll have anything that they need on it downloaded. They can download anything else that they need as well so it's just a full functioning ipad um and yeah it's actually a really really good you know tool to use for all of our students and just simplifies it makes it a whole lot easier all right very cool yeah i'm glad we're able to provide that for all of our students for sure coming in um then michael we'll stick with you um you mentioned that you are uh, the president of the aviation ambassador is that correct uh, what does yes. that role mean and and what's that organization do any and any other organizations you're involved in on campus um, so yeah, this past year I was the president of Purdue Aviation Ambassadors. Basically what we do is um, if anybody came and took a tour before uh, the whole pandemic happened, uh, that's what we, that's what our main job is. We give tours around the airport. Um, we're going to show people around, give them information sessions and just do, you know, events like this, where we're actually trying to help market for Purdue and, and get our name out there and just answer questions that anybody might have. Um, also, we can go on some trips as well. We'll go out to, you know, air shows. I went to West Virginia last year. We go to Oshkosh every year. Um, and we're just there, again, representing Purdue and answering any questions that people might have. Um, and then also, I'm the director of what was supposed to happen this year, but it got canceled for Purdue Aviation Day. Um, so that's the day where basically we have all the planes come out to the airport. Um, so I'm also going to be the director for 2021. So we'll see if we can make it happen unless, you know, it comes back next year. So we'll see. But um but yeah, so that's kind of what I'm involved in in aviation. And I encourage any incoming students to get involved. That is the number one way to sort of go out and meet people. Um, and not only that, but it's, you know, it, it's going to build that resume in other areas that some students might not have. So not, you know, everybody's going to graduate with their, you know, licenses and all their certifications. But what else are you going to have? And that's kind of what, what I kind of tell students. So um, definitely get involved. It's really fun. You meet people and you just make great opportunities from it as well. All right, excellent. And Michael, just a quick question. Were you in the aviation learning community as an incoming freshman? Yes, I was. Um, so I, I was in the learning community. I also lived on the floor in McCutcheon with, with all the flight students. Um, and those are all still my closest friends to present day. So definitely, I, I, you know, I loved just being in the learning community. I met people right away. I was living on the floor with people that had similar interests as me, similar career paths. Um, and you actually, it's a good way to like we were talking about, you meet people that aren't just pilots, because like, there's aviation management ma majors in the learning community, in the uh, community, AET majors, all these different majors. So you meet, you know, friends and people that are not in just your same major. So again, that kind of like holistic view of, of getting like a good foundation of aviation as a whole. Learning community is a great way to get there. And again, just to get in to meet people. Excellent. Glad you had that experience. And and we did have a question from the chat about the, the application. There was an early deadline application for learning communities of April 15th. You still can apply up until June 5th. So even if you didn't make that first deadline, feel free to still apply. Um, really, the, the placement um, opportunities just kind of depends on the number of students who apply for the learning community itself. Uh, but definitely apply. You still have that chance to get in there. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely recommend that for sure. 
Um, just want to uh, kind of change gears a little bit. We have some questions about our three plus two program. And Brian, maybe you want to kind of give a sense of what that looks like and, and how does it work with all the different majors? Do students in pre-flight do that with another, you know, adding in that, that's that, those extra two years? How does that look? Yeah, so the, the three plus two program uh, essentially is an opportunity for a student to get both a bachelor's and a master's degree uh, at, during their time here at Purdue. Um, you apply for the three plus two program in the junior year and uh, assuming that you're accepted into the program, um, you then um, enroll in three, well, in nine credit hours of coursework that have dual credit. So those nine credit hours will satisfy the requirements of the bachelor's degree, which is 120 credit hours, um, as well as meeting the requirements of the, uh, the master's degree. So because of that nine credit hours of, of overlap of dual credit, um, you can finish the master's degree essentially in one additional summer plus another year. So you get both a bachelor's and a master's degree in a five year time frame. And we've actually had some students, again, going back to the question about, um, you know, double majoring and things of that nature, depending on how many court credit hours you bring into Purdue, uh, we've had some students that have been able to, to complete the three plus two program in four years plus a summer. So they did it in about four and a half years versus the five year time frame. All right, very cool. And that's that's the option for any major within this yep. department. Yep, yep, an option for any any major. Now the, the aviation major or the aviation uh, master's degree, uh, and, and, and Tim or Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, but it is a degree in aviation management. So the, the actual master's degree will show a master's in aviation management. The, the, the coursework and things of that nature are applicable to all of the, the majors though. Yeah, I believe that's correct, Brian. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Um, Brian, we'll just, we're going to stick with you. We have a, a couple questions um, about just coming in as, as a flight student. If you have your private license, is there a flight check and what does that look like for students? And then kind of going along the same lines, um, the a medical exam, how do you, rec what do you recommend students do that to make sure that they're, you know, in that, that right healthy category to make sure that can happen? Yeah, so the, the, the medical, I'll start with that one first because it's the easiest. Um, I would recommend that you get a medical as soon as you can. Now, obviously, with the, with the pandemic and, and the, the issues with, you know, going to a doctor's office or things of that nature, you may have to delay it a little bit. But as soon as possible, you'd want to go to an aviation medical examiner. So it's not any doctor. It has to be uh, an AME. Uh, you can find a, a list of aviation medical examiners in your area uh, on the FAA's website. It's pretty easy to find. You can just go to FAA.gov and you go into the search bar and type in aviation medical examiner. Um, and, and there's a search engine that allows you to select or identify the, uh, the, the doctors in your area. When you go to that doctor, uh, you wanna get a first class medical. And a first class medical is the requirement to, to fly for the airlines. Uh, there are some things that are disqualifying. There are some things that you have to get um, a special issuance. Uh, and so you'd want to start that process uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, we have had some students that have delayed that process, um, waited till maybe the week or two before classes began. They ended up with a deferment, which meant they had to go get a special issuance and they couldn't start their flight training until after the first semester was, was complete. So you definitely want to get your, your medical soon, uh, get a first class medical just to make sure that you don't have any of those disqualifiers and that'll, that'll ease your transition into the program. Um, if you come in with a private certificate, you receive credit automatically for AT145, which is our private pilot flight course. It's a two credit hour course. Uh, just you'll show the, the certificate and by virtue of having the certificate, you'll get the, uh, the two credits. You do have to test out of the ground school, which is AT144. For those that come to Boiler Gold Rush, there is a test out exam on the Friday of Boiler Gold Rush week. Um, the, uh, the advisors help set it up and they help coordinate uh, that, that test out. If you're not coming to Boulder Gold Rush or you won't be here during that time frame, we do have another test out opportunity about halfway through the fall semester where you can take that test and receive those four credit hours if you satisfy that requirement. Uh, I will tell you that that test out is difficult. It, is, it does not mimic the FAA written exam. 
uh, is very much more in the terms of decision making, aeronautical decision making, command leadership. Uh, there's there's lots of application questions. Uh, there are some multiple choice, but there are also a lot of short answer, fill in the blank uh, type questions. So so it, it very much uh, assesses the the full scope of the knowledge of a private pilot. Um, and, uh, and if you do pass that, you you receive those four credits. If you don't pass it, uh, we have a online version of our private pilot uh, ground school. Uh, we also have an in in class version of the private pilot ground school, and you can find out which one meets your uh, coursework or your schedule the best for that uh, that that uh, fall semester uh, to be able to get those four credit hours because it is a requirement of our degree program. Uh, as far as transitioning into our airplanes, uh, this this coming fall. Uh, we actually are taking um, taking delivery of uh, Piper Archers. Uh, the first four actually showed up uh, a couple days ago, um, so that's pretty exciting. Uh, and we actually have developed a a transition course that would allow somebody that uh, that has no experience in the Piper Archers to be able to gain the experience necessary to be successful. Uh, as far as the coursework for the degree program is concerned, uh, if you come in with a private, you would start in what we call AT two forty three o two which is the first commercial ground school course, or commercial flight course uh, in the sequence of, of courses that you would take. All right, awesome. Thank you so much for that. That was a great explanation of all those things. Um, did have a question from the chat and Michael, I'm gonna turn to you for this one. Uh, being a certified flight instructor, are there any other benefits that you find doing that other than the flight hours? That's a question from one of our, our viewers right now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you'll hear from almost every flight instructor and a lot of pilots attest to this is, you know, you kind of realize where you were faulty as a pilot beforehand when you become a flight instructor. And some of the things that you may not have understood, now that you teach them, you actually understand them much better. Um, and then kind of going back to the point that we talked about earlier of what you do with your summers, it opens up a whole, you know, just array of opportunities that you can do in the summer. Um, like I know I go back to, uh, I'm from Southern California, so I go and I flight instruct in Orange County every summer. Um, and I've met, you know, many people flight instructing. I've met a lot of, you know, people that could be future employers, honestly, flight instructing. So um, definitely many benefits than just building hours. Uh, you become a better pilot as a result of it. You meet people. Opportunities are basically endless because you can just be a career flight instructor if you wanted to. Um, it's actually a career. So you don't just have to go to the airlines. Um, and you, you know, you might end up, if you want to go corporate, you might end up meeting the person who's going to employ you, you know, later on as a flight instructor. So definitely recommend getting it. And yeah, opportunities are, you know, pretty vast with getting a flight instructor. All right. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Tim, I'm going to turn back to you. Uh, just kind of, you mentioned earlier that you are in, kind of working in some of the different research labs. Um, could you kind of go a little more in depth in that? What kind of research opportunities are available for students in this department? Yeah, um, I'll speak to my area first. I direct uh, what's called the Hangar of the Future Research Laboratory. So probably 90% of the research I'm involved in, um, is, first of all, is a direct result of work that I do with industry. Many of the instructors that are at Purdue, um, Dr. Dillman included, we do um, a lot of work with the industry. We'll take our students out on those classic field trips or site visits, and we'll do a problem-based learning excursion. We may process map um, or receive dispatch operation for a large air carrier at one of their US or even an international hub. We found out where their gaps and their pain points are. We come back to the lab and that project, that, those real world gaps become your project. So it becomes your assignment. And that's where we sort of let you go out where the light bends. We take, out, uh, take the restrictions off and say in the, in research, lay out a good research process that sort of lets your brain out what kind of technologies are available, even down to Xbox or whatever it is you guys play right now, Switch or whatever kind of uh, gaming skills that you're building. Um, we bring those in instead of yelling at you to say, put your phone or your game away, bring out those ideas and those visualizations and let's go crazy with it. And then let's tilt it back into airworthy, reliability, sustainability, safety, Point, does it work on the flight deck or under the aircraft in 20 degree weather? Does that solution, whether it's technical or a process solution, work out in the real world? And so we'll do research in the laboratory. My, my lab, for instance, has a, we have a 3D printing, RFID, and near field communication, augmented and virtual reality. We've got a $20 uh, Google Cardboard and a $4,000 Microsoft HoloLens, the whole gambit. 
So we'll work on simple solutions and go full electronic on those and holographic and then fight the, uh, it works well on the lab, does it work out underneath the airplane upside down with uh, limited connectivity? Does it serve the, the end user at the point of maintenance or the point of operation? So some of the, the, the technologies I just mentioned there, or drones, I've got a drone fleet. Um, I don't teach drones, but I'm a user of, of drones. And all of the, we have four in our fleet in my lab that have flown um, inspections inside of engines or over a fuselage. We have uh, Lego League, if you are into robotics and Lego League robotics, my students built a Lego League robot that probably many of the viewers have seen or played with. Um, only we gave it a lobotomy, gave it um, some surgery and some smarter uh, electronics and some more high resolution eyeballs. And so now we have a robot that can follow a row of rivets. And then I got a hold of one of our um, um, aviation science majors uh, from, from AET. He's in the master's program and he does AI programming. And so now we have that robot looking at rivets and can recognize a good rivet versus a bad, a tip rivet. Um, is there damage or is it just uh, a little bit of dust on there? And so we uh, we take basic technologies and we innovate. We do mid-level rapid innovation. So we fail quick, learn quicker, just like industry needs. All those million dollar words I'm talking about are those, those are the same kind of buzzwords and competencies that the industry is looking for. I'm not the only research game in town. So uh, there's other people that do data science. It's nothing but data, um, uh, data management and they'll, they'll crunch numbers and put designs and predictive um, operations. They'll do airport operation, landing and takeoff operation counts, and they'll do statistical um, uh, look ahead like that. There's uh, advanced composite. Um, all of those surround the core curriculum, all four of our majors. And so you find an area that does a couple of the things that you like, probably 90% of what I do is below the wing or maintenance, and then ramp, um, excuse me, ramp an airport operation. Um, but you can cross connect into other areas that you find a faculty member that you can work with, that you, you seem to get, you understand their vision and that uh, you perform well for. So what we try to do when you come into research, even as a freshman, um, we try to get you thinking of yourself of, I'm more than just a pilot, I'm more than just an AET major, I'm more than just an aviation manager, but I'm a pioneer, I'm a researcher and a problem solver. And that's not, that's not trying to paint too uh, too pretty a picture of it. That's a realistic view. We want you to think of yourself as a real world data scientist. I'm a pilot and a data scientist. I'm an AET major and uh, a problem solver across disciplines because that in reality, that's what the real world, the real world aviation needs to be. So we push you to think of yourself, push you pretty hard to think of yourself as a, as a researcher as well as your core major. All right, thank you very much. Wow, that's that's a lot of cool cool opportunities kind of cross collaborate. Um, and then Tim, one more one follow up question about just AET and uh, Air Force ROTC. Is there coursework from the Air Force ROTC that would satisfy any of the AET electives and, and courses in that that major? Um, I'm going to quickly come to the end of my ability to answer that one. And I know we work with ROTC all the time. Uh, uh, so ROTC, we routinely work with that. What I do is have you talk to our advisors. I think our advisors are, um, they're better tuned off, just off the top of their heads to know what courses count. Um, if one counts, I don't, we don't fight it because if it meets our, our criteria, a lot of times you still have to meet the part 147 FAA coursework criteria, which sometimes even if you have uh, other ROTC coursework, that could be an equivalent FAA sometimes is the final authority on that. It just depends on what class what classes you're you're looking at. But we do work with ROTC majors all the time. Frankly, I like working with those people. They have a, a good head on their shoulders and pretty motivated. And and I, all our students. Up. Brian, let me chime in there just real quick. So sure. one of the things that I, I I get this question occasionally for flight students. And, and often what I'll respond to them is that our plan of study establishes 120 credit hours that's required for our degree program. A, a student can always take more than the 120 credit hours. And I know that they would prefer to get as much credit for the courses they're taking and the things that they're doing in that nature. But um, I, I often say, let's, let's evaluate the, the return on, on investment of a particular um, opportunity. And if that means you end up taking 123 or 126 credit hours, it may still be valuable for you to engage in that 
that particular opportunity, even though you may not necessarily get the maximum credit towards our specific plan of study. So that's something that you know you want to keep in mind as well that you you can't always do more. Now sometimes we have to rein some students back because they want to take everything under the sun, and we have to say, look, you know, you do want to graduate, and we would prefer to graduate in four years or or earlier if, if possible. Uh, but but that that's something to consider as well, especially again if you come in with a lot of credit hours already. Um, you know, you may end up going over the 120, and that's perfectly acceptable, perfectly fine. Okay, good to know. Yeah, for sure. Um, just want to back up real quick about the research areas within this department. Um, we actually have a, a special name for it. It's the Grand Challenges in Safety, Quality, and Sustainability for Aviation. And so, uh, like Tim was mentioning, there's a lot of cross collaboration, a lot of um, you know, a lot of different departments and those majors are, are working on a lot of those challenges right now. So um, definitely look into those research opportunities and get involved if that's something that you're looking to do. Um, highly recommend that for sure. Um, and then one quick question back related, um, I'm, I'm going to answer it just kind of related to the ROTC and cadet programs in general. Um, that's, that's something that um, the ROTC programs themselves would manage the application and acceptance processes. Um, so definitely look into the different ROTC programs that are at Purdue if that's an interest for you and reach out to those departments specifically because they could give you the specific details of how do you get involved, how do you get approved, and those types of things that are required for that specifically. Um, and then real quick, just a question, Brian and Tim, and Brian, we'll start with you. Um, is there a senior capstone project as part of the professional flight program? Yeah, so there is a capstone requirement for all of our degree majors. Um, the, the specific product uh, varies by program. Um, the, the, for the flight program in particular, uh, we tend to look at, um, you know, the, the, the skill sets necessary to be successful within uh, the, the, what we call the big iron, you know, the Boeing, the Airbus, uh, you know, the 737, the, uh, the A320. Um, and we actually have two of those devices on our campus. We also have a, a, a Hawker a 900 XP. It's a, it's a level D full motion sim. The, the Airbus and the Boeing are uh, level five ATDs um, or FTDs, sorry, level five FTDs. Um, and so our capstone uh, process will look at the skill sets necessary to be successful uh, and then identification of how that can be propagated down the line. So, so looking at you know, the, the, um, the heavily immersed technological aspect of the Airbus as comprised or compared to the Boeing and uh, looking at what um, modules, activities, things of that nature, um, you know, does a student have to have or, or be able to accomplish to be successful in those platforms. Identifying uh, a, a mechanism that allows a student to gain that technology or that gain that skill set, gain that competency and then being able to um, offer that to those individuals. So our devices, and, and this is actually something we're, we're exploring pretty heavily uh, with the remote world that we're in right now, uh, those devices are actually um, usable even if you're not on property, which is not, not typical of, of a flight training device. So as I understand it, you can actually log in or, or, or connect into those devices and you can manipulate the, the devices even though you're sitting at home. So we're looking at ways that we can leverage that opportunity to be able to uh, allow students to continue to advance their knowledge, their skills, their abilities uh, within those devices, even though they're sitting at home. So our capstone is looking at um, how that system would work, how we facilitate that, how do we, how do we teach it, how do we uh, enable students to have practice, and then how do we assess it um, in order to ensure that they, uh, they gain those competencies. And then uh, looking at ways that we can leverage that with industry. Uh, we have a very tight relationship with Frontier, uh, with, with United, well, really with all the majors in the legacy airlines we have a very good relationship with. Uh, some are a little bit more uh, innovative, some are a little bit more willing to uh, push the boundaries on, on the, the, the status quo. Uh, and so we look at ways that we can take what we learn and then, you know, replicate that within the industry platforms uh, to allow our students to, uh, to engage uh, in real world operations. So that's the way the flight program approaches the capstone uh, project. Um, it is a one semester project, but you do it in two halves. You do the two, two credit hour uh, proposal in the first eight weeks, and then you do one credit hour delivery in the second eight weeks. And uh, aeronautical engineering technology, like Dr. Dillman said, is very much similar to that. It's uh, the classic course that we have for AET is uh, AT 496, which is the 
um, applied research proposal where you learn how to identify a problem, uh, work with a customer. It's very Six Sigma and uh, customer oriented. We teach you how to write a proposal to visualize it, to scope it. And then the second uh, semester then is the applied project proposal development, whatever it is that you chose to develop. Um, I teach that. We have a primary instructor that teaches that, uh, Dr. Sergei Dubakovsky, during the normal sem regular semesters. I typically will take a summer session of this, which is a lot, a bit more compressed, but it's the same thing. Um, we'll work inside, like, like Brian said, either with faculty or with existing technologies and uh, work that we're doing at Purdue, or we'll work with industry. It's just whoever's available and what, um, if it aligns with the project at the time. And so the applied project is uh, it's an applied learning. You have to scope it. I had a student team last summer designed a $3 million hanger of, literal hanger of the future, um, LEED certified green. I, I told them that I wanted them to trick it out and 3D walk it through. So they did a, ended up getting a 3D virtual fly through of, a, of what a hanger if, if money were no object. But they had to come up with an ROI. They had to come up with a cost justification go out to industry and source those kinds of things. Um, we've had other students install sensors on ground-based equipment for servicing aircraft. Um, I had one student team that designed an entire next-gen hangar of the future uh, uh, ramp training course uh, that could be taken out to an air carrier and, and marketed if it got that far. And uh, it got interest, uh, a lot of interest from air carriers. So yeah, we have, um, I teach a, another capstone course, the large aircraft Airworthiness Assurance course I teach is a capstone. It's not a required capstone, but there's several of those around. And I sort of what Brian said, but we, uh, a lot of our courses, even if they're not capstone, we try to get industry involved. So we have those internships, as not just even an internship, but where industry is much more intimately involved in coming in and talking, shaping the project, um, challenging the students from a real world perspective, and uh, letting the students go back in and work on what they've learned there. So we try to get real world application and, and pull our partners in wherever we can. All right, that's that's great to hear, to hear about those industry partnerships and, and working very closely with our students. And um, just kind of want to kind of get into what's the next step then? And Michael, I'm going to turn to you. Um, what's your career goal? What's your pathway that you're looking at coming out of that flight program? Um, so me personally, I'm kind of exploring two right now, either number one, going to the airlines. Um, that's, I think, what a lot of students want to do. Um, we have a lot of really good relationships. Recruiters are constantly over at Purdue. They're constantly walking around the atrium, talking to us. Um, and, you know, they, they really want pilots, um, and especially once this whole pandemic passes and I'm sure everything starts to recover, they're going to start hiring just as much as they were before. So um, that's kind of what I was exploring. And. Now, number two, I'm also exploring maybe going more towards the corporate side. Um, so going towards, you know, flying for a company or flying for a private owner or somebody of that sort of uh, sector. So that's kind of the two paths that I'm exploring right now. All right, great. And then Brian wanted to share a little bit more kind of where you see, um, it may be similar pathways, but anything else you want to add to Michael's uh, kind of goals that he has? Yeah, I mean, the vast majority of our graduates go into the, the airlines. I mean, going to the regional airlines and to a, to a major or a legacy is, is a pretty common uh, sequence. Um, the one thing that's unique about our graduates, um, I believe, is that the, the most of our graduates don't stay in a line position for very long, uh, which is the, the, the classic position of, of you, you are the, the, the operator of the aircraft, right? You, you're, you're monthly activity is is going from a to b on on a, on a repetitive safe op, you know operative basis uh, most of our graduates do move into some sort of a, a training sector they, they they do also you know line activity still but they they engage in the training department uh, they're in the safety department uh, they get involved with their unions um, variety of different you know leadership opportunities that they engage in which is a little bit different um, we do have some students that will go to the corporate sector and, and then we have some that go to the military. I would say if you put a percentage on it, um, you know, probably 85 to 90 percent of our graduates go to the uh, to the to the airline uh, about, you know, somewhere between five and 10 percent go military and about five percent roughly go corporate. Uh, it is a smaller sector uh, of, of the operation. Um, currently, they require a, a little bit more flight time unless you have some sort of a, a connection uh, personally, like Michael was mentioning earlier. Um, you know, if you flight instructed at, a, at an FBO and you got to know the uh, the corporate pilots in that area, you can get your foot in the door a little bit earlier. But 
Um, typically, you have to have quite a bit of flight time to be, you know, get that that door open in, in the corporate world. So we do see occasionally, you know, our, our graduates will go to the airlines and they realize the airline world is not for them, and they'll make the transition to the corporate world from that point uh, moving forward. But that's that's I would argue that's that's the the, the main area is the uh, is the airlines for our graduates. Okay, good to know. And then uh, Tim, where where do you see your graduates heading out to? The list, I know I rattled the list off pretty quickly earlier, but uh, manufacturing, uh, aerospace manufacturing, the air carriers, and there are some students that come through that want to go directly into the maintenance, the maintenance, repair, and overhaul facility. That is a huge market and MRO. So they'll we'll have air, um, students that will go right out to aircraft maintaining, both in general aviation as well as the major air carriers. Um, we do have students that will get out and go into regulatory and they'll go into training uh, training facilities or going, like I said, manufacturing or uh, aviation and aerospace. Um, yeah, just I, I think uh, there's a broad application for our AET students coming out. It's not just um, I, I don't like saying it because it hurts me because I love aviation, but it's, it's beyond just aviation. It's anything that has. Uh, the technical side where the engineering design melts with the technical application and the ability to talk uh, both to the frontline operator about what's wrong, understand the component and understand that back into engineering and redesign terms as well as that bridge. And so if you can imagine technical a technical workforce, I was talking with a senior VP of innovation from Cummins, um, you know, the big engine diesel, uh, big uh, component manufacturer. Um, medical, biomedical, um, anything that has the technical process components with it, our students usually, um, it depends, but they usually can, can, if they have a penchant for it, can go just about anywhere they want with that on a technical basis, if that makes sense. Did that answer, answer the question? Yeah, yeah, definitely. We've got a lot of good options that, that you've seen our graduates go into. So, yeah, thank you for that. Appreciate it. A um, couple, hopefully, quick questions for you, Brian. One, I think you might have mentioned um, this before in, in relation to, um, I know our flight operations, you know, for, for students who are not in the professional flight, they can't just hop in a plane whenever they need to and, and try to get those hours. But what about the simulators? Is that an option for non-flight students or is, the, is that restricted as well? Yeah, I mean, still, it's a resource issue. Um, you know, we, we we do an evaluation of the the um, the, the request uh, every year, but the number of students in our professional flight program, which which has been growing over the last several years, uh, it 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 eats up our bandwidth uh, within the flight simulators as well um, for for our flight students. If if there was a period of time where we had uh, excess resources available, then we, historically we have offered those to students within the SATT um, family, uh, and then we open it up to the large university uh, as, as well. But, uh, you know, for the last probably five years, uh, there hasn't been additional opportunity uh, because the, the resources have been consumed for the students within our professional flight program. Yeah, that makes sense. So, okay. And then one other question in relation to students coming, trying to earn their private license prior to coming to campus. Right now, obviously, maybe they've gotten up to that certain point where then they're doing their check ride now if they can't. Where do you have any advice or any recommendation for what that would look like if, you know, when they're coming to campus, how might they be able to complete that? Yeah, so um, this happens every year where a student gets to a point where they're ready for the check ride and either the examiner is not available or the airplane goes down for maintenance or something of that nature. Um, you know, I, I, I would encourage people to try to take their check ride sooner rather than later, right? Try to get that done. Um, you know, don't delay, don't, don't plan out, you know, that you'll be done with your, your flight test the week before classes begin uh, because weather may hit or other things may, may get in the way. Um, so, you know, front load as much as possible so that doesn't become a problem. If if you don't finish before you show up, then it's a matter of what's the delta between where you are and getting your private. And there have been some students that are far enough away, we actually enroll them in our private ground school within the university and they finish their private here at Purdue. There have been some that are fairly close to getting their private and they actually coordinate with Purdue Aviation, the, the fixed based operator on the field, uh, do a intro flight or, you know, get a get a transition flight um, with them. And then they take a check ride with a local examiner. Um, 
In some cases, uh, they, you know, student will intend to do that. And for whatever reason, it delays things, um, you know, quite a bit of time. And so they don't finish their, their private until we're maybe halfway through the fall semester. Um, and they're, you know, they're working with Purdue Aviation or, or somebody else. Um, and if that were the case, uh, we would just, you know, treat them as an incoming freshman that doesn't have their private. They, they finish their private, not with Purdue University, but wherever they're at. And then they enroll in their next course, which would be AT24302 uh, in the spring semester uh, of, of, the, of their freshman year. And so they would be essentially on pace with everybody that came in without their private that did their flight training at Purdue at that point. So they're, they're not they're not delayed. Um, and, and frankly, um, getting your private before you come to Purdue doesn't put you ahead of the game either, uh, because most of our students, at least from what I've seen, by the time you hit the junior year, um, you you essentially even out uh, and you're within, you know, about the same level of uh, experience and training and things of that nature uh, as the rest of your classes. So it's not a situation where if you come in without your private, you're behind everybody else. Um, basically, you know, from what I've seen, it all, it all, you know, evens out by about the junior year, maybe, maybe the first part of the senior year. Okay, good to know. And then one question that I get a lot as a, as a recruiter, um, and mainly because our professional flight program is very competitive, very popular, is what are the chances or what's the process look like to change your major into professional flight? And maybe you get this one a lot too, yep. based on the smile that you're coming on. So what, what does that look like for our students who are interested in doing that? Yeah, so um, we have a we have a CODO, which is change of degree option uh, process, where if you did not come into Purdue University uh, in the professional flight degree, uh, you can apply to CODO. Uh, it is a competitive process. Um, in the fall semester of your freshman year, you would let the academic advisors in, in SATT know that you're interested in CODO. Uh, they would start giving you the information that's necessary. There's an application process. There's an evaluation process. There's a uh, informational session. Uh, I'm the one that actually runs the informational session. That's why I was smiling. Um, the, the, the process, um, once you've submitted all the documentation, the flight faculty, which there's five, there's five fa flight faculty. I'm one, one of the five, um, does an evaluation of your the holistic picture of you and the likelihood of your success within the degree program. Um, I can tell you that uh, your high school GPA isn't as heavily weighted in the CODO process as your success at Purdue. Um, college is different than high school, uh, at least that's what I've seen, you know, probably working with uh, lower level freshman, sophomore, uh, junior students. Um, it is different. So we look at your success rate in your first year. Uh, we also look at your success rate within the aviation coursework specifically. Um, and, and we also look at your level of commitment towards your certification. You don't require a private certificate to be able to CODO, but we do look at how heavily invested you are in pursuing that. So it, it is a holistic picture. Um, we identify, again, because we're heavily resource-based, we identify the number of spaces that we have available to be able to allow our students to propagate through our degree program. And then if there's 10 spaces available and we have 20 applications, then we look at the number of students that are the best suited for that, you know, those 10 slots. Uh, there have been years where we haven't filled all the spots available because there weren't candidates that we felt would be successful in our degree program. Uh, there were instances or years in the past where we had 10 spots available and there were 15 candidates that were available and we actually increased the number of students that we brought into the program because we felt like it was it was you know the quality of the student in that particular cycle was such that we wanted to grasp all of the students or a, a larger number than we initially started with uh, coming into the program so it, it's it's hard to pinpoint exactly the process because it is based on so many different factors but generically that's the that's the system I, the, the 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 starting point would be to talk to the academic advisors, let them know that you're interested in codoing, and then they would get you in the cycle of communication so that you uh, get all the information you need to be able to submit your application. 
Okay, awesome. Thank you so much for that rundown. I really appreciate that. Yep. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out to uh, Peter and Jacob, our two student ambassadors who are in the chat, still responding to your questions. I know there's still a lot coming in, so we really appreciate your patience with our responding to your questions, and um, hopefully we'll get we'll get everything answered as much as we can. Um, is there an internship requirement for the majors in this department? Uh, Brian, we'll start with you. Uh, yes, there is an internship requirement for the flight program in particular. Uh, that, that requirement is typically satisfied uh, for those that get their certified flight instructor certificate. Um, there, the, the process is maturing as far as what that looks like. Uh, there is a requirement for you to have a reflective, um, you know, uh, assessment of your internship. Um, but even those that actually do, an in, do, do get their flight instructor certificate, uh, they find the value in doing an internship at a major airline. Uh, worth the extra experience um, as they're moving forward. So in, in some cases, they're satisfying the requirement of the internship twice, once as a CFI, then once as an internship with, with, a, with an airline. And then Tim for AET, would you respond to that? Yeah, um, I'll try to get as accurate as I can. There is a, a, a internship, uh, it was a requirement and I need to actually go back and look at that one because I, uh, Regardless, when we have an internship requirement, we help the students get connected with um, the various technical companies, wherever that is. Uh, right now, all of our students will have a, an international uh, experience as well as an internship that they will uh, coordinate in with their um, with their coursework. So there is an internship um, requirement, but I think there are some some things that we help them with on that. I don't want to speak too much more. I would really need to get with our advisors on. Uh, I know we have them and we do them and uh, we push those very heavily, but I'm not sure where those fall on the requirement at this point. Sorry about that. Oh, no, that's no problem. Um, well, I just want to kind of touch on how you, and, and maybe I'll actually I'll turn to Michael on this one, um, how you get connected to those industry partners. And I know this department is one that has two different career fairs every year. So uh, maybe you can share some of your experiences with kind of getting connected at those career fairs with industry partners. <laughs> Yeah, definitely getting getting out to the career fairs is going to be your number one way, I think, um, because, you know, these airlines don't send different recruiters for every career fair um, for all four years. Unless that recruiter leaves that specific company, you're seeing the same recruiters in the same places over and over. So even if you're a freshman and you may not think, oh, I'm, I'm not going to get a job for another three years, I don't need to go. I definitely recommend going. So the career fair is going to be the number one way. <clears throat> um, another way I can think of is when they come to our atrium, I mean, Recruiters are constantly hanging out at the airport and just sitting there and talking to students. They also come in, into dispatch where we get our you know, keys for the airplanes and things like that. Um, so just talking to them, putting a face with the name, just starting that conversation. Uh, that's going to be a really great way to meet those those people. And then, like I said earlier, you know, flight instructing is going to be another way to get out. And if you kind of want to go more corporate, find those businesses in which you kind of want to integrate yourself into. So it, there's different ways to do it, but the two career fairs are going to be the main way that's because that's where we have all the companies in one place um, and they're there to recruit. That is what they're there to do. That's why they come to the career fair. They know it's a career fair uh, and they want to recruit those students. Um, we have a couple questions from the chat related to military um, organizations. Are they at, uh, represented at the career fairs as well? Yeah, so we do have some military um, represented at the career fairs. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, and Brian and Tim, I'm not sure if you're going to be able to answer this question, but we've had a few questions come in through the chat um, currently with our situation in the pandemic. Do we is there is, do we anticipate any changes with any sort of internship requirement or anything along those along those lines? And maybe it's too early to tell with where we are right now. Uh, but I don't know if you've had any conversations with other faculty or the department um, and what that looks like. Yeah, I, I guess I would say it is too early to tell right now. I mean, the internship. Uh, requirement in order to, I guess I can say this, I don't believe the internship requirement will be, will be removed from the expectations for graduation. How a student meets that requirement, how rigorous that requirement is, um, what satisfies the expectations of that. Um, I mean, essentially when, when, the, when the audit is completed uh, for a candidate for graduation, there is a checkbox that says internship. And the advisors have to be able to check that box. What it means or what they need to be able to check that box can vary from year to year. 
Okay, yeah, I, I kind of figured it would, you know, we're, we're still kind of figuring out what the fall semester might look like. So yeah, that's that's a, a fair assessment of that we'll probably try to figure that out as we move forward and see how things redevelop with like, like Michael mentioned, and then Brian, I think you mentioned too, just right now, the, the airlines are kind of at a standstill. So it's just one of those things that once we get back in, into normal operations, what that looks like, um, I think we'll, we'll kind of make those adjustments as we go. Um, so just want to kind of wrap up with one last question for everybody. And Michael, I'll start with you. Um, what is one piece of advice that you would want to share with incoming students to help them be successful in this department? Um, number one, I think I would say get involved. Get involved in something to kind of branch out and meet people. Um, I think that would be my number one piece of advice because so many students come and they just focus on going to class and Yes, that is important and, and excelling in the academics is important, but also it's important to get out and, and see other things, meet other people in the university or within the school, um, you know, and get involved in some sort of club. It doesn't even have to be aviation. You, if you want, if you have other interests as well, maybe go out and get involved in that um, because, you know, the, the opportunities that you get from getting involved in something, you know, a club or anything else, um, you know, they might shock you when you get here. Just the adopt, because so many people know Purdue. It's such a global name that, if you do get involved, you'll be shocked at how many opportunities come your way. All right, awesome. Yeah, I, I that's one of my pieces of advice as well when I talk with students is get involved with something that's related to your major, your department, and then get involved with an organization that's just for fun. And there's, I think, close to a thousand clubs and organizations here at Purdue. So you're gonna find something that's probably gonna relate to something you're interested in. And if not, somehow that doesn't happen, get some students together, find an advisor and start another club because we're open to that as well. Um, and then Tim, what's your piece of advice for incoming students? Yeah, um, I'll piggyback off what Michael said and, and add to that a little bit. I think he put it very well. Be uh, resilient when you come in, uh, love your major, know your major and read up on it. You should be looking out and what, what's happening out in your industry. What do, what's the hot topic? What are, are, where are the big worries at? Where are the growth markets? You should uh, just keep tabs on that but be resilient enough to know that it doesn't even have to be in your major if you participate in research or a club. Um, so to echo what he said, you'd be amazed at the number of career opportunities that open up that you never realized existed until you took a chance or sort of bent with the force a little bit and, and went a certain way that you weren't anticipating to leverage what you're learning. So yeah, jump in, be courageous, um, be a little bit of the pioneering spirit, a little bit resilient um, with the opportunities that come up, regardless of, of the format, and you'll be uh, that will open doors. That and the Purdue is known worldwide. That that helps to open doors. It's not the only thing, though. You have to sort of be willing to to be an explorer, which is the scary fun part. Right? <laughs> scary fun. I like that. That's a good way to put it. All right, and then Brian, your piece of advice as well. Yeah, so so I give this advice to all the incoming freshmen that I interact with in the flight program. Uh, I've given this advice to, to my two oldest kids. I have six kids and my two oldest uh, just graduated from Purdue last year, uh, one in physics and double majored in math and the other in human services. Uh, and I've given it to all my other uh, kids as they, as they enter into whatever the next level of their education may be. Um, and it's pretty simple. It's, it's go to class. That's, that's the first thing, right? So, so you, you have a schedule, you actually go to class, right? Once you're in class, pay attention. Uh, and and I, I'm not, I don't even necessarily advocate that you actively engage, although that would be, you know, the next level, but the, literally you pay attention. So, so you put your, put your phones away, uh, you know, the screen that's on your computer, it should be focused on note taking or, or other activities. You don't need to have other things pulled up uh, because regardless of what you may have been told, you're not a good multitasker. So you need to actually pay attention to what's being you know, discussed or talked about in class. Because here, here's, here's, a, here's a carrot. Um, typically, at least the way I approach it, if I feel it's, it's important, I'll talk about it in class. And if I talk about it in class, I'll test on it. So if you go to class and you pay attention, you're more than halfway there to be successful. Take moderately good notes. You don't have to record everything, but capture the stuff that you feel is important. Study a little bit for your exams, and you're going to get at least an A or a B in every class that you take. It's, it's that simple. That's all you got to do. Show up to class, pay attention, 
take moderately good notes and study for your exams and, and you'll be successful. The other piece, the other side of it, I'll, I'll often say, you know, treat it as a job. You know, you, you come to class, you, you know, you have a, you have a work time, use that time during the day to accomplish the tasks that are necessary. Um, I like a good binge watch on Netflix just as much as the rest of the, you know, the rest of the group. Uh, but I tend to hold that for times when I'm not at work, right? So those are the two pieces of advice that I typically give. No, I think that's great. Yeah, that thinking about it as an eight to five, you know, that's typically when your classes are, and then you have that time in between, do some extra homework or study, take you know, read those notes. I think that's very important for sure. Um, well, I just want to thank everybody who's been viewing at home and joining us tonight. I really appreciate your attention and, and joining us with this broadcast and our panelists as well. Thank you for their time um, and their insight into the aviation department here at the Polytechnic. Um, this broadcast, you can watch it again. It'll be on our website, polytechnic.purdue.edu slash live. So you can see this broadcast as well as all the other broadcasts that we've done in the last couple of months as well as previous years. So get a lot of insight. Um, I know obviously things are a little bit different now, but definitely take a look and, and get some information there. Um, if we didn't get to your question that you put in through the chat or one of our students didn't respond to that, please send us an email, techrecruit at purdue.edu. We'll be able to respond through that as well. Our landing page um, through our main um, homepage, polytechnic.purdue.edu, there's an admitted students uh, landing page that has a ton of resources that we've put together, documents related to your plans of study, your department, your major. Um, there's actually two videos related to aviation technology. There's one with a presentation of some current students about the department, and then one that's a facilities tour. So you can actually see the airport. Since you can't come to campus and join us, we kind of we wanted to bring that to you as, as easily as we could. So um, definitely take a look at that when you get a chance. So um, take a look at the, all those resources, the, the outcomes, the salary averages, placement data, those types of things are out there as well. Um, so if you have any questions, though, please reach out to us. That email address, there's a, a way for you to request a phone call from one of our staff members. Um, there's a Facebook group you can join and post some questions as well. We're trying to get out there and, and make sure we're connected to you in this current situation. Let us know how we can make that easier for you. So once again, I want to thank you all again for joining us tonight. And um, again, reach out and let, let us know if you have any questions. And have a great rest of your evening. And with that, I'll end with Boiler Up. <laughs>